Welcome to Submission Radio, another episode here with a very special man. You know him from his fantastic analysis on both Morning Combat, the Luke Thomas show on Sirius XM, and of course, his very own live chat. He is kind enough to take some time away from his family to jump on and chat with us once again during what is an absolutely crazy and appreciated time in MMA. The man himself, friend of the show, absolute legend Luke Thomas, is back on Submission Radio. Luke, thank you so much for joining us, man. How are you today? I'm doing quite well. Gentlemen, how are you? We're doing very well. Really appreciate the time today. Um, obviously, there's a lot to get through, so we'll get straight into it. We all know what happened with UFC 249, obviously the events and the, the future events being postponed. Um, I want to circle back to, to last week, though, specifically to the shitstorm that happened on Twitter, uh, the, the finger pointing, the blaming. And I'm just wondering, why do you think so many fighters and managers were blaming the media, obviously, at the end of the day? We, the media, would have benefited massively from this event taking place and going forward. And um, obviously, we're all fight fans. We want to see fights. Why do you think a lot of that kind of um, slipped past the fighters and managers and promoters and, and really a lot of people? There's a lot of different complicating factors here. Um, I mean, if there, if there was any evidence that like the different subgroups, well, I should say this, that the structure of MMA in terms of how the groups operate with one another for any kind of mutual gain it's completely broken uh it's such a mess and this it didn't it, this didn't break it but it revealed some of those fault lines let's say so there's a couple of things here right you've got a lot of managers in mma and i don't want to say this is true for all of them because it's not but there's a lot of them that uh, outright believe working with the ufc sometimes not in their client's best interest um is the right way to go about having business because they might be the only or the best game in town. And so preserving a relationship with the UFC is beneficial absent other considerations. That could be one. Um, another one is I don't think people really, I mean, everyone loves to like, here's what's so funny, right? Like fighters, they're right. When they say, if you've never fought, you should have a degree of humility in assessing what they do. And that, that is hundred percent true. Like they're right about that, mm. but then they never, I don't want again, this is not true in totality, but there are some of them. I want to say, that believe that they could just, you know, if the flip, uh, if we flip the switch, they could do the media's job, no problem. And I don't think a lot of people really understand what the media's role is. Number one was a big part of it. Number two, what the work entails. Just today, CNBC reported Vox is going to lay off 100 mm. people or furlough them anyway. Mm. I, I worked, I don't work at Vox anymore. I worked there for 13 years. I guarantee some of that will be inside MMA and certainly for sports. I, I absolutely guarantee it. Um, and so when you're advocating on behalf of something going away that would actually hurt your business, um, you know, people just can't wrap their head around the idea that like, wow, we can do something that doesn't involve self-dealing in an obvious and direct way. I think that's another part of it. But the last thing I'd say about it to wrap it all up is, look, there are some people acting in bad faith. And then there are some people who just disagree, right? And that should be noted, too, in all those groups. There could be fighters acting in bad faith. There could be some who just disagree. Managers, media members, everyone can be divided between legitimate disagreement and then bad faith posturing. The one thing I would say that I think this really showed me was, um, I, you know, I'm not entirely sure how true this is in Australia, but certainly in the United States this is true. Um, the culture wars in the 1980s and the 1990s here, where, where you have these different uh, political identities – they were fought along things like a very serious consequence. Um, let's say gun rights, abortion, affirmative action, that kind of a thing, right? And uh, you notice what the word I used was there was political <clears throat> political groups. But now it's become layered into every part of identity. So now what you see is um, uh, you can't wear Nike because Nike supports Colin Kaepernick, so that's out. <laughs> you can't eat a Chick-fil-A because Chick-fil-A uh, is run by, you know, uh, it has a religious essentially bent from their owner. And so you can, so in other words, it layers onto what you eat, what kind of music you listen to, what mm -hmm. your friends are, what kind of news you watch. Here's what you saw. People didn't want to make it political, but it ended up being really political where you had people who, uh, who might listen to one side of the ecosystem of media and they might think it's quite serious. They might listen to another side and think it's not quite serious. And that falls along the same partisan identity group lines so this was the first time that like i had seen a uh culture war inside of mma because the covid issue has been made uh because the because the culture wars eat everything now mm. and so why wouldn't it eat this one and so you saw that play out inside mma 
Mm. It's fascinating. Everybody's looking for someone to blame as well. <clears throat> and I guess media is one of those things. And with the election coming up over there, down your way as well, Luke, it must make things quite difficult with everybody pointing fingers left and right. But let me ask you this. The governor of California ultimately stepped in and put a put a hold to the event. He put a call into Disney, the head of Disney, and then that the head of Disney called Dana, Dana White, and then Dana White stepped down and then canceled the event. My question to you is, what was your reaction when you saw Disney get involved? And with Disney being a family-friendly uh, company and someone that's always sort of been very careful not to upset people and not to put out a product that tarnishes their brand, when this fight island is ready, do you believe that Disney would actually allow the UFC to fight on this fight island if there's a lot of scrutiny from families and their target demographic and could potentially damage their brand? I'm not sure why people think this was like some great adult in the room scenario where Disney stepped in and said, we had enough. Uh, I don't really buy that. <laughs> they didn't say or do anything, it appears, until the governor of California called them and then Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is a reprehensible creature, however, however, <laughs> she is, here, here's my point. Every time you bring someone up, they're always like, I don't like this politician. I don't mm. like this politician either, but that's not the question here. The question <laughs> is how powerful are they, mm. right? And so she was a, she is a ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, man. That's like, I mean, we're talking about a very, very important political figure for the state of California, which is the fifth largest economy in the world. Dude, ESPN and Disney did nothing until the phone started ringing from Gavin Newsom. Like this, I, I mean, I'm not privy to those phone conversations. Okay, fine. But if they didn't say anything until the governor got involved, why are we operating under the pretense that they were sitting there biting their nails the whole time, hoping that something would go right, uh, or you know, really worried about the state of things? They, they didn't act until they were forced to act, essentially by either political pressure or however you want to describe what Gavin Newsom um, applied there. So like, I'm not in any way working under the assumption that ESPN were the adult in the room here or Disney either. I'm operating the assumption that, you know, remember Disney is having, or was supposed to have a changeover in leadership right as this crazy crisis hits. They announced yesterday, they're going to have furlough 40,000 people. Their parks are in peril. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Disney's a huge and complicated business, but doing business in California in many ways is part and parcel to their existence. Mm. So when the governor calls and says, you better you better figure something out here, that to me is the story here. The story is not corporate, I don't know what you wanna say, corporate responsibility. I, 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 I mean, I, I will say this, if that is proven wrong, I'm happy to come back on the show and say, you know what, I was too negative about it and I should have uh, given uh, Disney and ESPN the benefit of the doubt. But ESPN, Dude, Outside the Lines aired over the weekend, right? Which is supposed to be their watchdog program. You know how much they devoted to like critiquing everything that happened? Even like even just a, you know, talking about it in some kind of full-throated way. Zero, nothing. Hmm. You saw a little bit of Will Kane being like, why can't we just find solutions? I don't know, Will. <laughs> the shit's real bad, dude. I don't know. Maybe that's why we can't. You know, it was just like, you can't, like, dude, this idea, again, this idea that, dude, ESPN is not a disinfectant of MMA. It is an accelerant of everything bad. It is an accelerant. You've got to wrap your head around that. And the reason why is because the journalistic arm of it has been totally neutered. Mm. Uh, they're partners with the organization. Jimmy Pitaro, the head of ESPN, made it a point to say on Peter Kafka's of Rico Decode podcast, we want to give people more access. He was explicit about it. There has been really no check on the UFC since they joined with ESPN by ESPN entities in any kind of full-throated way whatsoever. Uh, and so, you know, this idea that, like, they were the ones who had to step in and save the day. No, they got told to step in and save the day. I am not convinced at all that this was any kind of, like, you're asking about the future. I mean, we'll see because now it's out there and people kind of are paying attention to it. Mm. But, like, going forward, are they the watchdogs? No, 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 no. Not even a little bit. Do you think the location of Fight Island makes a big difference as far as who may or may not step in in the future? Like, I imagine, you know, Big Gav isn't going to call again and be like, hey, you know, don't do Fight Island or Mickey Mouse gets the chop in California. Like, if Fight Island is near, like, Costa Rica or something, you know, far from the U.S., do you think that makes it more likely that it will happen, the UFC can self-regulate and not really worry about government officials getting involved? Yeah, I mean, Costa Rica's not that far. Uh, it's only about four hours or so from the States. It's closer than Panama. Mm -hmm. um, I was, well, it depends where you are in the States, obviously. My but geography from, is terrible, Luke, as you can tell. 
Yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, it's uh, it's above South America, so let's put it that way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that far. Um, I, yeah, yes. I mean, the answer is you would want to go to a place that is close enough that far away places outside of the U.S. Um, can get there with relative ease. Plus, it would involve a degree of um, you would imagine self-regulation, and they might do the whole bit where they, you know, they bring in Nevada entities, or you know, they follow a certain protocol, or you know, who who knows exactly? Like, I don't think they're going to go in there willy-nilly. I, like they like they were trying to at Tachi Palace or whatever the arrangement there was going to be. I think they'll go in there, even if it's self-regulated. They're going to wait until at least one state is giving the green light, and then they might take guidance from that state and say, "Hey, we're following this to the letter," you know. So I suspect, I suspect it'll be that. I, my thought was it was going to be somewhere in the Pacific because that way you, you could get a lot of Asian fighters, Russian fighters, mm. potentially, right? I mean, the Russian ones, it's a lockdown, but I'm saying once travel restrictions ease a bit, um, but maybe not. Maybe it's in the Caribbean so you can get Brazilian fighters slash European fighters to come over again once restrictions ease a bit. I do think the location matters, less so for regulatory scheming, but more for um, what is a sort of neutral-ish place that a lot of people can get to with relative ease. And where that might be, I, your guess is as good as mine. Mm. It's a bit of breaking news, but really I believe that the Fight Island is going to be in Tasmania. So there it is, everybody <laughs> listening right now. And also, you know, possibly when, when they do find this island, it could become like a new Australia, Luke. You know, send your convicts over there when it's not being used for fights and eventually turn it into a country that has a low corona rate. Anyway, let's talk about Florida quickly because... That is a place. Rub it in. Rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> that is a place uh, that you have brought up quite a number of times in your podcast. Mark Ramondi recently reported that Florida has deemed employees at a professional sports and media production with a national audience, including athletes, entertainers, production teams, executive teams, media teams, and others as essential. And Ramondi also tweeted that when he asked Cody McLeod, press secretary for Florida government, uh, I might run if a UFC event or boxing match could be deemed essential. It could, McLeod said. The memo does not specify specific sports as long as the event location is closed to the general pub public. So the UFC would still need a commission to sanction the event. But how do you think this affects things moving forward? And the crazy thing is you were the man that was predicting this massive ad break in Florida weeks and weeks and weeks mm. before it happened. How do, you, how do you react to them actually being open to the events happening, even with what's happening over there? Well, let's be clear about something. I didn't predict it. I just listened to the people who did, and they all had, all had a ton of credibility. I was just listening to them. I'm not I'm not in the business of giving predictions. I'm simply saying, hey, everybody, these uh, experts on this matter are saying the house is on fire. Maybe we should listen to that. It's only getting worse, too, by the way. Mm. Um, yeah, boy, Ron DeSantis is something, huh? The governor in Florida. Florida, Florida is like... Uh, a shitty version of Australia. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. <laughs> Here's what I mean. Australia has a lot of natural wonderment, right? Mm. Where you've got, you know, uh, unusual wildlife, let's say, unusual people to a degree. But, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are reasonably, uh, for the most part, quite civilized, very friendly people, uh, educated, worldly. Yeah, said, right, right. Wonderful coffee, great podcast hosts. <laughs> and then there's wonderful people in Florida, too, who are, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, it's great Hulk for Hogan. retirement. Uh, yeah, but here's the thing, you know, it's just a lot of toothless Joe Exotic fans who, you know, and crazy uh, political bents down there where you just get a lot of people, people, people coming and going a lot of ways that normally map around the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. So, OK, here, here's the point. First of all, understand why that happened. Uh, Vince McMahon is a total Trump booster. This guy, DeSantis, is a total Trump uh, uh, ally, mm -hmm. which is impacting part of his decisions around public health. His wife, uh, Vince McMahon's wife, used to work in the Small Business Administration for Trump and now runs a Trump super PAC. Like, this is, you know, this is my opinion, but this appears to be quite naked political corruption, right? Mm -hmm. Out in front, of, in front of you of everyone. Now, what it has to do with the UFC, I guess we'll see. The two complicating factors is, one, um, the, the language said employees, and I saw Eric McGracken of Combat Sports Law note that, like, well, hello, UFC fighters are independent contractors, so would yeah. the language really apply? The answer is maybe not yes or no, but no one really knows. The other factor is the one about ESPN. They're not really watchdogs at this point, but they had their back against the wall, and they kind of had their hand slapped by the government. Uh, maybe they're going to wait until a commission really comes up with COVID-19 protocol, and I think that's when this will all open up again, um, rather than there's a legal loophole they could take advantage of. But... I mean, I didn't think we were going to get as far as we got, and so we did. 
So mm. anything's possible, I suppose. Just before we get off, you know, the topic of, uh, you know, UFC events moving forward and coronavirus and all that kind of stuff, I'm just wondering, do you see a way where Fight Island could actually be a good thing and to be able to do it successfully? Not in terms of you know, revenue or anything like that, but just a, a way that it makes fighters more safe. Or do you think this could potentially be a, a situation where you have one island, someone comes in with coronavirus, and then basically everybody gets infected? Yeah, I mean, that's the other part about it. It's like, oh, we're building out the infrastructure. Curious to see what that is. I mean, I'm not in any way poo-pooing it. I'm curious to see more about it. But it's like, what is the island's protocol in case COVID-19 breaks out there? Mm. And the the argument, I'm sure, would be, oh, we would take precautions so that it wouldn't. Okay, right. So let's say that it, I mean, it sounds like Jurassic Park. Oh, the, yeah. <laughs> the dinosaurs will never get out. Right. What, what happens if they do? Right. That's what I want to know. That's that's the that's the question there. So we'll see. I, I'm, but in theory, I think fight. I, I mean, here's the thing. The thing I'm focused on is, and I saw this interview with uh, this uh, epidemiologist, I can tell you his name, from Emory University, which is a prestigious university in the United States. His name is Zach Binney, and he did this interview about what it would take for sports to go through this, to get Fight Island, or I don't know if you guys saw, Major League Baseball wants to have like, you know, this weird seg you know segment off all the uh, uh, Major League Baseball players so they can't go anywhere else and they just have this weird season of seven innings seven innings it's just you know totally bizarre stuff and his, his the basic you know if you just he didn't say this explicitly but if you just read through basically what he says is right now given how bad the spread is it's just not I'm not saying it's not possible but it's extraordinarily difficult to do and really put people's minds at ease and you know, reasonably prevent the spread of this disease right now. But then they talked about Taiwan. You know, Taiwan has done a phenomenal job in uh, handling this. Taiwan now, groups of 500 or more can get together. Now, that still doesn't wow. allow you to open up a stadium. It doesn't allow you to, you know, have it as normal. But you could, uh, 500 people, dude, you could host UFC fights every day of the week in Taiwan. I mean, mm. it would be nothing. You know what I mean? So the, his point basically is, is if you read through the, the, the uh, interview he did, as soon as this, as soon as you get a handle on the virus and cases go down and you've got it under control, the logistics become way easier, way easier. It's just right now, it's very, very difficult. So to ask about Fight Island, I'm less consider, I'm less interested in to what extent that is some kind of oasis away from the problem. All I'm focused in on is let's see a commission come up with protocol for it. That you know that by the way, the coming up of the protocol happens in a transparent way in public we can all see and weigh in on it and experts are called and they kind of figure this out that's what i'm looking for because if you do that it's not just ufc that gets to come back it's lots of them well not lots but probably the bigger promoters mm. can start to get the ball rolling again fight island is cool because it'll be shot probably in a unique way and they might be able to build some reality programming around it it'll be fun it'll be different i said this on morning combat you know, every time they go to Vancouver or Perth, if you're just watching inside, it, it, all the stadiums look the same. You know, mm -hmm. they all all the venues look the same. It might look a little bit different because it's outside, presumably. So that that's kind of fun. To me, that's fun. But I'm focused on let's get a structure in place that everybody can follow, that we can reasonably believe that protects people, and let's get the ball rolling once that's ready. Mm. The itchy and scratchy land uh, metaphor also applies to Fight Island when you think about it. But you also spoke to Kevin Drapper of the New York Times recently, and he said that Mark Shapiro, the president of Endeavor, the UFC parent company, said the financial pressure was not a motivator for the push to keep the UFC schedule going. What we did see that according to Yahoo.com, S&P Global on Monday downgraded its credit rating for Endeavor from B to CCC+. Plus which for everybody that's still listening to this interview, takes the company from highly speculative to substantial risk. So just breaking that down, do you think Shapiro's claims are true? What does this mean for the company? How, how bad of a shape do you think that it's in? Uh, well, that's a little to be, uh, some of this is still unclear. Mm. To me, the thing that we have to look at is some of the loan covenants and then when the payments are due and what happens when that's the case. To what extent, I mean, he, Here's the basic problem with Endeavor. Um, two, or two things, I should say. One, they bought into a lot of live event businesses. It's pretty sweet if you can have a live event. Mm. Um, if you can't, that begins to, you don't have enough of a diversified portfolio of how your revenue is generated. That's one problem. The second problem is they have operated on thin margins. Um, they had acquired a lot of debt. So yes, they had, I mean, UFC has been very, let's be clear about this. UFC by itself as a property for Endeavor it's a huge win. I mean, UFC is killing it. Uh, granted, everyone is running into trouble at this moment, but let's say 
you know, uh, up to February 2020, dude, UFC was, I mean, smashing it, smashing it. And they were poised to have an even great, greater year with the return of McGregor and everything. So that is a very valuable asset for Endeavor, and there should be no mistake about that. Um, but the problem is they had so much debt, not merely with the purchase of the UFC, although that's the biggest one, you know, um, but they had other assets that they had purchased, and they had done it leveraging their debt. Then, um, la end of last year, they had tried to have a, a, an IPO, and it failed. They tried to have you know, people essentially let them go public, have a bunch of cash infused as people buy stock, and use that to sort of uh, buoy yourself, and it went away. Then they pulled out a $300 million dividend from what the UFC had made, and to give it to their celebrity investors as well as other folks who were waiting for money from that failed IPO. And you just get to a scenario where it's like you're the, many of your core businesses are not operating. You're on thin profit margins. You're spending what you have to make up for other losses, and you have an extraordinary amount of debt. Not great, Bob. Not mm. great. Um, mm. it's, it's a, you know, it's, I'm not here to say that that's like calamitous or just bad. Don't really know. Kind of a wait-and-see approach. But – you know, it's not it's not great, uh, and it gives you some concern about um, less so the UFC because if we got to again, and I am wildly speculating about this, but let's say it gets to the point where they have to sell it off as an asset, dude. Whoever picks it up, I mean, it's a jewel of an asset. They're going to be fine. It's just sort of this weird moment about um, how these companies are run and. Uh, if there are any consequences for the UFC, if they end up trying to retain it and how that might alter the business in terms of how fights are made and what the business strategy ends up being. So it could be a little dicey. It's hard to say right now, but there are some some warning signs. Yeah, that's absolutely wild. Um, we want to ask you about some more wild things, such as Tony Ferguson versus Khabib, that fight potentially getting rebooked, and Justin Gaethje versus Conor McGregor. But just speaking of wild things, this Ridge wallet is absolutely wild. I know you've been hearing me talk about it for the last few weeks. This is my actual wallet about how sleek and sexy and streamlined it is, how it comes with a lifetime guarantee, how it comes with free shipping worldwide, free returns if you don't love it, how there's over 30,000 five-star reviews, how this one is carbon fiber. You can get titanium. You can get aluminium. You can get it pretty much any way you wanted it. All sorts of different colors, fancy designs. It keeps all your stuff safe. It's RFID safe. It's got a fancy cash strap. You can get a money clip if you like. If you want, you can go on the website, ridge.com forward slash submission and use the code submission for your cheeky 10% discount. And you've been hearing me talk about all the places that I've taken my Ridge wallet to over the years, you know, like UFC events, like the Great Wall of China, like Stonehenge, like the Lincoln assassination, like the Last Supper, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, Michael Jordan's iconic dunk, Kim Kardashian's house, the moon, uh, and of course, my local supermarket. So the Ridge Wallet, it's been there. It's been there, done that. It's been absolutely everywhere. So get one for yourself. Uh, 30,000 five-star reviews. It's cheap. It's got a cheeky discount, and a discount is something that we desperately need in dire times like this. Ridge.com forward slash submission. Use the code submission for your 10% discount, and a massive, massive thank you and shout out to Ridge.com for sponsoring us through these hard times. Um, but like I mentioned, I want to get your thoughts, Luke, on Tony Ferguson versus Khabib Nurmagomedov. If you were kind of relieved that this event, you know, got delayed and this Justin Gaethje versus Tony Ferguson fight fell through so that now hopefully we can see the fight that we all wanted, which is Tony versus Khabib. Also, wanted to get your thoughts on Tony Ferguson saying that he's going to cut weight by Friday and make weight by Friday, the uh, the originally intended time for the weigh-ins, which on one hand, super admirable thing. It's, it's admirable to see what a hard worker and what a dedicated human being Tony Ferguson is. I mean, we all love the guy. He's awesome, but also it's a pretty risky thing to risk, you know, cutting weight and lowering your immune system in such a crazy time. Um, and also I wanted to get your thoughts on Conor McGregor versus Justin Gaethje. If you think that is the fight that may potentially end up happening, I know it's a, it's a ways down uh, the track, but just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I mean, it is really, uh, and this is the hard part. This really all depends on when we're going to get back. <sighs> Jesus, you know, like, are we going to get back next month? Are we going to get back uh, in June? Are we going to get back August? Like at that point, it becomes the matchmaking becomes a different calculus each time. The one thing that I think will be the same would be I do think Tony versus Khabib they're going to try a sixth time. I do believe that. Uh, hope for so. Connor and say again. I said hope so. Hopefully. Yeah. No, I think I think they will. As for Connor and Justin, I won't even say because it's just there's just no way to know. Maybe. 
I, I know that they had talked about it. They had both said that they wanted it. We'll see. Um, but as far as Tony, it's so on brand. Dude, I mean, I mean, the thing about Tony is, you know, when does he get injured? Like, just walking around. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, if he's training and he's cutting weight, I'm actually less worried <laughs> about him. <laughs> I actually feel like he's like, wow, he's depleting his uh, – He's depleting his body and uh, potentially compromising his immune system. Ah, uh, just don't walk on any cables on a studio set. Yeah, and we're good, dude. You know what I mean? Like honestly, he has like, like with these people like Tony who march to be their own drum and know their bodies and know themselves and know what they want to do. I've always found in life, just let them do it for the most part. Try to try <laughs> to stop the very worst excesses of it. Mm. This is unnecessary, but depending on how he does it, if it makes him feel better and he can stay happy and he can stay motivated, and there's not too many risks involved, I say let it rock. Mm. Well, we appreciate your time, Luke. The most important question of the interview and the final one, we promise. The thing that everybody wants to hear you uh, break down and quickly give your thoughts on, did Carol Baskin do it? You know what? <laughs> let, me, hold, let me ask you two. Let me ask you two. You've seen Tiger King, which is truly the best that America has to offer, yeah. if it wasn't already clear. Um, <laughs> what, do you guys think she did? There's a lot of tigers, and they're typically hungry, and then a husband goes missing. I'm not a scientist, but that's about as open shut case as you can get. I, 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 think, Howard, <laughs> I, think, I, I think Howard should secure a, some kind of casket, is all I'm going to say. I think I, – here's There's what I say. There's a shortage you know, right now. Everyone thinks I like try to go for the angle that no one ever uh, believes, and I'm trying to be contrarian. I'm not. Here's what I – I'll meet you halfway. Look, bro, she's – I mean <laughs> – She's fucking weird. All right. Can we just say that? She's fucking weird. All right. And I'm not. If it came out that there was evidence tomorrow that she had killed her husband, would any of us be like, wow, I just can't believe this. I am so shocked. Mm. Never. But here's what I will say. I remember when they made these claims and I watched even the most recent updated episode, the one where they could catch up with everybody. Mm. It's a bit you know? shit, that one. Yeah, it sucked. But uh, well, the dude has teeth now. I was happy for him. <laughs> yeah. But. But here, what you end up seeing is they try to make this claim that the Tigers are no better or worse off with Carol than they were for any of these roadside zoos. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was an interesting claim. I don't know why I did, but I tried to look it up. Now, this is not an area of expertise, so if somebody has better information, by all means, please tell me. And these sites that like uh, Jeff Lowe set up and that uh, that Jeff Joe Exotic had set up, some of them are still, still up. Mm -hmm. But if you count animal rights groups, like legitimate ones, even if you may disagree with their mission – credentialed ones, right? Ones who like, and like savvy ones, like ones who know how to lobby, ones who have a PR arm, ones who have particular mission statements, right? Um, if you look at their examination of various rescue uh, facilities and whatnot, dude, not only do they not say Carol Baskin is, is bad, they say her treatment is exemplary. Mm -hmm. And here's the funny thing about it. I can't find one animal rights group that says, her treatment is on par with Joe Exotics and whoever else's roadside zoos. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd. And then you go and you talk about that. The dude who went missing, right? The I guess he's not the first husband, but the second one, technically. Mm -hmm. Baskin mm -hmm. would be the third, right? Or uh, mm -hmm. Howard would be the third. Remember the story she told about how she got picked up? The yeah. dude just sees a distressed woman yeah. on the side of the road. And it was like, come get in the car. Like he's Gargamel trying to catch Smurfs or some shit. I'd hold my gun. She says, right. And then it says... Here, hold my gun, to, and if you don't like me, you can blow my brains out. Boys, I don't know about you. I, I didn't marry my wife by handing her a firearm <laughs> and saying, blow my fucking brains out. It, so here's what I'm trying to say. This guy was going to Costa Rica. Dude, who knows what shady shit that guy was in. Mm. Shows up to an airport. His car is there, and then he's gone. Look, man, maybe he got fed to tigers. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he did had some drug deal go bad. I don't know. I'm going to say it's 50-50. What I can say is, the documentary made very specific claims about the treatment of animals at her facility, and I'm not an animal expert, but the ones who are say that's entirely not true. Mm -hmm. I'm just not prepared to take their other claims at face value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going to well, pop up on Fight Island. They'll dig him up, no doubt. Well, I was going to say, because of, yeah, of all the afflictions shirts, hopefully Jeff isn't the man to save the UFC. But, guys, that is L. Thomas, at L. Thomas News on Twitter, of course. Check out Luke and Mortal Kombat. It airs every Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. That's Tuesday here in Australia. The Luke Thomas Live chat. 
Luke Thomas Show on Sirius XM is now also available worldwide on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, and Selected. It's the Selected Highlights and the full show, and we are loving that, Luke, and I know a lot of people down here are loving it too. And, guys, that is the show for this week. A big thank you for tuning in. Have a safe week. Uh, try not to kill your husband, and we will see you next week. <laughs>